guys, welcome back to the video. Today we are reacting to Film Theory, the end of Rick Sanchez, Rick and Morty season four by the Film Theorist. So I really don't expect from three to one. Let's react. Hey, congrats on the first half of season four, Morty. Thanks, Mad Pat. Glad you liked it. It's a show that, you know, takes a lot of brain power to understand. I know! We have to- What is that microphone? That sounds really bad. Compared to Mad Pat's microphone, that sounds like echoey and stuff. That sounds bad. Do another theory on your show. Oh, jeez, Mad Pat. Haven't you done enough of those already? Really, really seems like you're milking our franchise for cheap YouTube views. Yeah, you're milking it because it gets views! 1.5 million right now. In seven hours, I'm pretty sure. So he's he's just milking the views out of us. Which works! Tell me again how many episodes season four has. Ten. And how many multi-week breaks have you taken during the rollout of those ten episodes? Well, we're on number three right now. So tell me again, who's really milking this show for the views? Still? Yeah, alright. I mean, I'm still waiting for season four, episode six, seven, eight, and six, seven, eight, nine, and ten on Netflix. Yeah, so I'm still waiting for that. Maybe good, maybe bad. I don't know. I need to look at it to find out. Oh, you. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show where we explore all of the infinite realities and at this point have made a theory about most of them. You know, I've really enjoyed doing individual episode breakdowns of Rick and Morty this season. I guess you could call it Matt Pat selfish content. I did it because, you know what, I just really wanted to talk about this show with someone other than Stephanie all the time. And luckily you all seem to enjoy those little fast turnaround mini- Yep, and they and they like this. 1.5 million views. 82,000 likes and 2,000 dislikes. Views is not the only thing that makes it like you like it. It's the likes because you don't milk out of the likes of somebody, you know? Theory episodes too, which was great. I would expect to see probably a couple more of those show up when the second half of the season drops. That said, this is not one of those theories where I spend a lot of time breaking down an individual episode or an individual character or specific moment. This theory is about season four of Rick and Morty as a whole and where the second half of the season and beyond goes from here. Because more so than in past seasons, there seems to have been a lot of disgruntled Rick and Morty fans out there talking about how this has been a disjointed season. One without a whole lot of focus, no real themes to latch on to. Nothing deep being explored and a parade of toilet humor, shrimp heiling the Third Reich, and like, snakes. A, a surprisingly large amount of snakes. As the user Dr. Lecter put it on Reddit, quote, in season four we're not really seeing those family dynamics anymore. Now the premise is just fan service, cheap laughs, insane antics with no grounding and furthering the plot or the premise of the show, end quote. And I use that quote as an example, but it's really indicative of a lot of the conversation I've been seeing around this season of the show. But is that really true? What is the point of season four? Is is there a point? I mean, sure, in earlier seasons, the through lines were a lot easier to follow. Season 1 turned sci-fi tropes on their head by showing that when you fix a problem with sci-fi magic, you actually create disasters. You wish your dog could talk? If he could, he'd enslave you. You want to shrink down to explore the human body? Too bad you're gonna blow up a giant floating homeless Santa in the process. You want a hot girl to fall in love with you? Well, spoiler alert, she's gonna turn into a praying mantis and try to eat your head, thereby necessitating you to abandon your entire dimension. In Season 2, we start to get real glimpses of just how powerful Rick is, but also the rampant wake of destruction that he leaves behind. Rick fractures time, he upends peaceful planets, he enslaves aliens to power his ship's battery, he sells weapons to assassins, and gets most of his friends killed by the end of those ten episodes. Fast forward to season three, and we see how the damage that Rick causes isn't just on a galactic scale, but also on a personal one, specifically with the Smith family. The unhealthy relationship that exists between him and his daughter Beth has massive ripple effects throughout this season, as it prompts Beth to leave Jerry, resulting in the kids struggling with the separation and Rick ultimately not being able to provide the emotional support that any of them really need. I turned myself into a pickle, Morty! Boom! Big reveal! Pickle Rick? Ew, I'm a pickle! Until finally they've had enough and Rick is forced to return hat in hand, specifically fishing hat. 
in hand. I'm fly fishing, Rick. No, not every single episode necessarily plays into these themes, but overall, Rick and Morty seasons do indeed have arcs, which means that in theory, season four should be no exception. So what is the arc here? And if there is one, what's it saying about the narrative arc of these characters? What can we expect when the series returns, whenever it decides to return, which apparently, according to my Google News alerts, was supposedly January 12th then January 19th, then the 26th. Seriously, it got me excited each and every week. Seems like a lot of websites are worse at predicting things than even I am, and that is saying a lot. That said, knowing my track record, I'm sure that sometime between me writing this episode and me hitting publish on this video, we're gonna get a trailer that directly contradicts everything that I'm about to say in this theory, so whatever. Selfish content activate. In case you need a little refresher yep. on Rick and Morty season four, here's the fact recap of the five episodes we've gotten so far. Episode 1, Rick and Morty harvest some death crystals that show the user exactly how they're gonna die, and when Morty sees a version of him dying with Jessica by his side, he makes every decision from then on to preserve that future, causing a lot of carnage on the way. Morty! A bunch of us girls were gonna go skinny dipping later if you wanted to join. No thanks! Why don't they see the death crystal then? Why do they see a big crystal on his forehead? Stuck on his forehead. And they don't see it. They really don't. Must continue moving in ways that lead to dying with you. Meanwhile, Rick gets himself killed, but keeps on getting resurrected into various clone forms, trying to get back to his original reality. Many of these realities are dominated by fascist animals, but Rick is eventually helped by the wasp version of himself to get home. We're all in this together. We're wasps. Not monsters. Guess I don't have it as bad as I thought. Episode 2, Jerry makes an app, so you know how this one's gonna play out. What are you guys doing? Did you develop an app? In an episode concept ripped straight out of Black Mirror, we watch the world tear itself apart using Jerry's date-finding app, Love Finders, which tells people who their soulmates are gonna be, but changes that match constantly. Meanwhile, Rick goes on a hunt for revenge to punish the man who used his super-secret secluded toilet. What begins as a quest for bloody vengeance becomes a budding friendship when Rick learns about the premature death of the man's wife. A friendship that itself is unfortunately cut off prematurely when the phantom pooper meets a tragic skiing accident. Episode 3, we get ourselves an inception level heist scheme with Rick building a machine to randomize heist plans only to demonstrate how nonsensical and formulaic they are. Well done, Rick. Rando Trump? I'm afraid not. What you thought was a random non-plan to get to me has been a meticulously choreographed way of bringing you all in. At the end of the episode, we get ourselves the big twist. That the root goal of Rick's complex twist. heist plans was in itself a complex plan to sour Morty on the concept of heists. Since Morty had been working on a heist screenplay that may have gotten him a deal with Netflix, and thereby prevented him from going on future adventures. I don't know, five of my friends got Netflix deals. You could lose him. I'm not gonna lose him. I'm, I'm gonna nip this in the bud. Episode four? is probably best ignored. It's one of the oddest Rick and Morty episodes to date, which is a lot for a show that once turned a character into a pickle. Morty gets himself a dragon who ultimately soul bonds more strongly with Rick, thereby leading us- I also forget that episode. There's no, there's no way YouTube would allow such dragon depravity. So here's the ocean. I, I don't remember anything about episode four instead of that dragon. I really don't. I remember the app and then when I remember everything but episode four. I also don't remember episode five. I don't remember anything because it's been that long. That long that I've seen Rick and Morty season four. That's down a rabbit hole of dragon depravity. Also, Jerry goes to Florida with a talking cat that's presumably more depraved than even the dragon, so we, we never really learn cat. what the cat's deal is. And in episode yeah. five, Morty gets bitten by a space snake, which he subsequently oh. kills and feels guilty oh, about, leading him to send an earth snake back to the snake's home planet. When the snake planet realizes that they aren't alone in this universe, they invent time and space travel to attempt to take over the earth, forcing Rick and Morty to do some Terminator-style time travel to kill the snake ancestors and prevent their dominance. Why, why are they attacking us? You gave them proof that there was something bigger and scarier to unite against, you little idiot. They dedicated themselves into making universe-destroying, unthought-out technology like time travel. Now, that all might seem random and disconnected, and honestly, it is. Yeah, it's very disconnected. It's not like a flowing series. It's like, what is happening? You know? That doesn't link up with that. Episode 2 doesn't link up with episode 3, but it should because it's consecutive episodes, but it doesn't. Even as I sit here writing and recording the episode, it's like high fantasy to snakes to death crystals to heist 
plans. It's a weird mix of episodes, but when you actually take a step back away from looking at individual episode plots, it all points to one common theme, which is ironic because the theme is about the fact that life is just a series of random events. Let me explain. Each of these episodes deals with the idea of fate and whether or not destiny actually exists. Spoiler alert, the show concludes the answer to be no, but let's look at each episode to figure out how I came to that conclusion. Episode 1 is pretty darn on the nose. Rick and Morty pick up death crystals that show you how you're gonna die. If you focus on following one extremely specific path or another throughout your whole life, you're guaranteed to know how you're gonna kick the bucket. It's like literal- Yeah. I mean, does anyone know- Does anyone want to know when they die? I don't. I really don't. Because when that day comes, I'm gonna be scared like a person that is scared. You know? Really holding your fate in the palm of your hands. Or is it? As the episode unfolds, Morty blindly follows the directions of the crystal in order to control the one thing about his life, how it ends. In the meantime, he's completely lost control of everything else, down to the direction that he can walk down the halls in school. And even then, as the end gag reveals, Morty's perceived death wasn't gonna play out the way that he expected it to. I wanna comfort the people who are dying, who have no one else in their lives. The real lonely people. What? This in turn serves as our thesis statement for the rest of the season. If you try to control your destiny, you'll lose control of pretty much everything else. This whole idea is underscored by Rick's plot in this episode, where he hops across infinite universes and infinite versions of himself. We're reminded that there are really infinite realities, a pressing number of which are fascist, and the idea of following your one true destiny is laughable in the face of an infinite multi- to show us just how futile the idea of control is, we get this example towards the end of the episode. Here, a holographic version of Rick, who has been powerless to do anything to control his own fate for the entire episode, finally gains a physical body for the first time. The first thing he does, celebrate how powerful he is. He can suddenly control everyone around him. He is all powerful. He can move. Yeah, he can do anything, but not. He doesn't do anything. Spoiler alert, episode two doesn't do anything. Yeah, it's, it's episode two. Of objects, and he's immediately killed by the wasp version of Rick one? from another universe. Punctuating- Was it? It's- No, yeah. It, it was episode one, not episode two. I forget everything. The idea that one, wasp stings are just totally terrifying no matter what universe you're in. And two, as soon as you think you're in control of things, you're toast. There's a lesson here, and I'm not the one that's gonna figure it out. Don't worry, Rick, I'm doing this one for you. Episode two lightens things up a bit with that fun romp through dating apps. And destiny, go figure. Love Finders is an app that supposedly predicts your soulmate. Everyone on Earth, desperate to find answers in their own confusing lives, immediately latches onto this idea, showing that everyone is just looking for this elusive idea of their destiny, finding their one true love, the person they are fated to be with because, well, that would mean that there's a plan for everyone's life. The problem is that people's soulmates keep changing, ultimately ending up being random because there's no such thing as a soulmate. And by proxy, there's no such thing as destiny. Life is random. Sometimes you end up with a winner, and sometimes you're attracted to a guy whose only future is as a telemarketer for diet supplements. Yeah, life is just random. You don't know what's gonna happen. You can't travel through time. You don't, you can't, you don't, you can't do anything, but you can do everything. Yeah, it, uh, your life is just random. It hits you. I don't know what I'm saying. It's just, life is random. You don't know what's gonna happen. Laments. On the off chance that you use the app and there's someone out there waiting for you, I... Jerry, uh, I didn't use it. Did you? Me? No. Well, then we're all good, dog. We also learn a little bit more about how this destiny business applies to Rick and his bathroom habits over in his plot line. Rick's remote, shy pooping habits are a desperate bid for control in a universe where he feels out of control. You need the same thing I needed, Rick. You know what shy pooping is, Rick. It's a pointless bid for control. You want to take the one part of life that you truly think is yours, and you want to protect it from a universe that takes whatever it wants. It took my wife. It clearly took something from you. We can spend our lives fighting that. But we can choose to be free. Rick knows, probably better than most, that the universe is random, but has always thought that just maybe if he's smart enough, he can control it. The thing is, his fixation on control ruins everything else in his life. Just like Morty controlling his fate ruined Morty's life in episode one. Rick is desperately lonely. He can't even connect with other people like Tony, who he has a lot in common with. And instead, he spends most of his time sabotaging the people and relationships around him. For Rick, relationships present elements that he can't control, like emotional vulnerability, 
responsibility, loss, obligation. So keeping these things at a distance is the best way to control his own fate. Interestingly enough, this episode also presents what could have been a lesson for Rick. Towards the end of the episode, Tony decides to not let his need to control things rule his life anymore, and instead he sets out to do the things that he loves to do, that he's been too afraid to do. This could have been an example for Rick about how great life can be when you just let go of control, but it's not, because Tony dies. Anyways, uh, just wanted to drop these off and you tell him, uh, the toilet's all his. <sighs> Tony died. He quit his job, started living life to the fullest. He crashed into a tree space skiing down Mount Space Everest. Because the universe is random, and letting go of control doesn't give you any more control over whether or not you live or die. Season is a downer, but I think you're getting the drift. Episode 3's Incepto Heist continues the themes of fate, and Rick trying to control it with an arms race for the most randomly executed controlled heist in the universe. Again, the idea here is that it's futile to control your destiny, even for an AI. Even for the smartest guy programming AI. It's all- I feel like this is- very, very deep right now. It's Billy Idlish gives his deep level type of stuff. Wrapped up in a totally confusing A plot. You believe what I programmed you to believe. Yes, because I programmed you to believe that. 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 The whole heist was all just Rick trying to exert control over Morty's future by getting him to turn down a deal with Netflix. Yet another grab for control by Rick. That being said, Netflix, if you have an opening in your schedule now, I would love to share with you my super secret goal of being a game show host. Promise it won't be as obnoxiously America's favorite game show. I mean, Amer you know, you know, it's America has too many game shows. I think because there's a lot of game shows, and if you add another one, no one's gonna watch it because people are only watching Jeopardy, Family Feud, or other game shows. But they're on like. Who wants to be a millionaire? Um, there's a, there's other game shows. There's a lot of game shows in the United States of America, which if you get another one, you might succeed, but most likely you won't. You won't edited as The Circle. I really tried to watch that show. I know you really want me to watch it. You've been shoving it down my recommended feed all the time, but man, I watched like the first 10 minutes of it and it's, it's rough. Anyway, episode 4 keeps the fatalistic, destiny-defying party going by taking every D&D fan's fantasy and ruining it with dragon stuff. Doesn't seem like this one would tie into the theme directly, but it's no coincidence that the show takes the high fantasy themes of dragons and soul bonds and heroic quests and then completely undermines them all. Historically, these fantasy elements appear in stories that have some kind of destiny. Drop the jewelry into the volcano, save the world, go on an epic journey because it is your destiny. You are the hero. In our random chaotic universe, we use high fantasy as a means of escape because those stories are nice and linear and they make sense, kind of like the heist stories. But no one in Rick and Morty is the hero, and this isn't a D&D &D game where there's a dungeon master guiding the story of your character. This is a real universe where your best friend dragon that you were contracted to have suddenly soul bonds with a senior citizen and it ain't pretty, and it certainly isn't destiny. High fantasy more like grotesque reality. The TLDR here is your fantasies won't save you and there's nothing romantic about our story. It's just kind of icky and uncomfortable, just like reality. The last lesson this season teaches us is in episode 5, which is less about trying to control your own fate and more about trying to control the fate of other people. Or snakes. S snake people. S sentient snakes. It's just a weird season, alright? In an effort to control- Yeah, it's snakes. Like, I should forget the, de the dead of Morty's name. I know it's Bess, and then the daughter, and then the dad. I forget. I, for I really forget. It's Dan? Was it Dan? I forget. I haven't watched Rick and Morty in a long time, because they haven't been do releasing episodes in a long time, so I'm not watching them. So, yeah, I forget.
control the fate of an overpopulated snake planet, Morty sends an Earth snake to replace one he accidentally killed in outer space. In the process, Morty directly tampers with the fate of an entire species. He changes their perceived destiny. Unfortunately, not only is fate not a real thing, you shouldn't tamper with someone else's because it's gonna come back and bite ya. Literally. Over the course of the episode, we see that trying to affect your future, or worse, go back to your past to fix your future just results in a big old mess. The universe is too complicated to tamper with what's supposed to happen, or attempt to control anyone else's future. You can't do it, even if you're a sentient snake, even if you're Rick Sanchez. At the end of our half season, we have a lot of open questions, but one thing we know for certain is that we can't control the answers. There's no trick in your way into controlling your fate because you don't have one. And on that uplifting note, we're left to piece together what this lesson means for Rick, the people in his life, and the rest of this season. Everything around Rick this season is telling him that there's no controlling your place in the universe, and frankly, his family is starting to tell him that too, directly. Morty refuses to blindly follow Rick in episode 1 by failing to resurrect him, not even listening to his arguments before flying off in a spaceship. Morty knows that Rick will say anything to control the situation, whether or not it's in Morty's best interests. In short, Morty leaves Rick for dead in episode 1 of this season, and isn't concerned about it in the slightest. He's also become bored with adventures by the time that Rick and Morty are grave robbing in episode 2, and in episode 4, Morty has to be bribed with promises of a dragon before going out with Rick. You asked me to cut class and fight robots with you, I said no! His relationship with Rick, which has been the foundation of this franchise, is on the rocks. He is sick and tired of Rick's antics. Morty's not the only one either. Beth, Rick's devoted daughter, is also finally standing up to Rick's manipulative control over her and her family's life, starting as soon as episode one. I don't know if adventures fit into my son's life. I'm fine! And again in episode four. I'm, I'm gonna nip this Qua in the bud. No, as a matter of fact, you're not nipping anything in the bud. If Morty ever gives up on a single dream, it had better be because of his own disillusionment. This is a far cry from the Beth that we saw in season one, who was desperate to make sure that her father stayed as a part of this family no matter what. Even as recently as season three, she still wanted him as a part of the family. But now she's over it. She sees Rick for who he really is, and she's had enough. She's also stepping up in her own life, taking an active role in Mothering Summer in episode two as part of her oh, new yeah, mother. Summer. Summer is the name of the daughter. Yes, I remember that. But I still don't know the name of the father. I still... I still don't know. I, s I can't remember. I forget the name of the father because they haven't been releasing new episodes tomorrow. Antra, a role that we have never seen her take on before. I'm gonna mother you until your 18th birthday, even if I get thrown in prison for non-consensual mothering. We also see Beth reconnecting with Jerry, criticizing him less, yes. making choice. Jerry. I know it was, a, it was like a typical dad. I was thinking between Dan and Phil, but it was Jerry, Summer, Beth, Rick, and Morty. And Mr. Poopy Butthole, because he's just there. Voices that show that she's rebuilding a stronger, healthier relationship with him. Which we all know is not making Rick happy. And though she may be non-consensually mothered, Summer ain't taking any guff from Rick this season either. He offers to take her on adventures, and she couldn't care less. You wanna go to Boob World, Summer? Eh, not today. <sighs> This sucks. Again, a far cry from Summer that we've seen in previous seasons. She's more self-assured than we've ever seen her as a pop culture tastemaker. Or I will tweet and you will be cancelled. And demonstrates repeatedly that she don't need no man or Grandpa Rick to help her make decisions. Oh god, the wizard must have hung Balthrama! Can we go back then? Lastly, we have Jerry. Yeah, even Jerry, for crying out loud, is maybe the most pronounced arc in the series to become a stronger- Wow, even Jerry? The dad, he doesn't care less about Rick, and he now, he's now in the group of things that are here, I don't know how to go. Her person, less influenced by Rick's constant demeaning. He gets reassurances from Beth that they're together for the right reasons in episode two. On the off chance that you use the app and there's someone out there. I didn't use it, did you? No. Well then we're all good, dog. And in episode 5, Jerry actively problem solves, even if it's in his own haphazard Jerry-esque way, refusing Rick's help to show Beth that he can function on his own and not giving in to Rick in situations where he would have previously run away to a Jerry daycare. Jerry, I'll tell you what, because it's Christmas, I'm gonna do you a favor. I won't let you die, and I won't tell Beth that you almost killed yourself. Sounds like a win-win to me. If I survive, it'll be without you, and if I die, it'll be on your ass. Merry Christmas, baby. Long story short, the fa Merry Christmas. Quah!
family is moving away from Rick. Four seasons in, the family finally recognizes that Rick's tight fist of control isn't for their own good. He isn't some benevolent genius force of the universe. He's just a lonely, depressed, drunk jerk, and they're all done tolerating it. That's why throughout these five episodes, Rick is either alone or finding a new companion in most of them. He's alone in episode one. He's alone again, searching for Tony's friendship throughout episode two. He's reconnecting with old friends in episode three, and he's spending his time with Bartholomew, the dragon, in episode episode 4, completely disconnected from his family proper. As we head towards the back half of the season, my money is on the storyline of Rick becoming more and more isolated as his family loses interest in his antics and his weird novelty because the guy's just toxic. He's self-destructive. He's a vortex of sadness that'll eventually get himself and anyone near him at the time killed. They don't need him anymore. Rick, for his part, has abandoned his family in the past, but this time, it looks like the family will be the one abandoning him. Or, probably more likely, Rick will see the is happening and just leave first so he can get the last laugh and say he was the one who chose to leave. If the theme of the season continues, it seems likely to end with Rick completely broken off from the Smith family, alone with no one and with nowhere to go, which in turn sets up the next season as his quest for either character growth or the hunt for a replacement family. So say what you will about the comedy of the season or the overall episode structures. They're not my favorite, but they're also probably not the worst. Oh no, episode four is probably the worst. But anyway, the rest of them are pretty darn good. I love the toilet episode. But one thing that you cannot say is that the season isn't forwarding these characters, their growth, and their story arcs. They've changed dramatically throughout this season from where they started in the first place. And Rick, as the one who is slowest and most resistant to change, is looking like he's going to get left behind. Rick and Morty is never one to beat the message over your head too hard, which is one of the things I like best about it. But regardless of what comes next, you can bet one thing. I'll be there to break it down selfishly. Selfish content for the win. Selfish content that at the end of the day is still just a theory. A film theory. And before I let you go, one favor I gotta ask of you. YouTube lately has been asking its users for satisfaction surveys. Basically, they'll see a video that you've watched, they'll throw- Yeah, I, I know about that. They've been doing it for a while. Satisfaction surveys. Sometimes I rate one, sometimes I rate five. Sometimes I just rate what I want to rate on that video. I'm not, I'm not really always giving fives. I'm giving actual stores not fives all the time so yeah Throw it back into your feed and be like hey on a scale of zero to five stars what did you think of this video if you could rate us at a high ranking that would be tremendous that is seriously the single best thing that you can do for this channel right now because sometimes theories are controversial whether or not people agree with you they might like give you a thumbs down or whatever but quality of the video is still there right and so rating it a high quality video so that way youtube is like wow this is a channel that produces high quality videos Let i mean it depends on the quality of the video because if the quality is I mean, if the quality is bad, then I'm gonna rate it a bad score, but normally, film theory and game theory videos are not really bad quality, so I'm probably gonna rate it somewhere from 3 to 5, I don't know. Let's spread it out onto the platform and not hide it away from the rest of the world. That would be great. So if you see one of those surveys pop up, I'm showing them on screen right now. They kind of look like this. They tend to happen more often on mobile devices. But if you can rate us a five star, that would be tremendous. Thank you so much for doing that. And hey, if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you subscribe. So yeah, guys, thanks for watching. And of course, peace out of the space. Wow, that space bar was very loud. I I'm not broken my space. Because when Rick and Morty. Alright, it happens. Yeah, I say it's for watching, of course. Peace out, you guys. Peace. Peace.